It is a story that I have told before, and some of you have heard it, but I haven't told it for a long time, and this seems like the right time. It happened to me about 30 years ago. I had written the first two books that I'd written, and both of them were about the Jewish idea of God. One was called The Healer of Shattered Hearts, A Jewish View of God, and the second one was called In Speech and in Silence, The Jewish Quest for God. And at the time, I was teaching at what was then called the University of Judaism. And I was at my desk, I remember it as if it was yesterday, and the phone rang. The other end, someone said, my name is so-and-so, and I'm a reporter for Newsweek, and we're doing a cover story on God. Would you be willing to be interviewed? So I said, sure. I thought to myself, I remember thinking, make it short. You have to be quotable. Can't give them like long sermons. It won't end up in Newsweek. And among the things I said was, look, I grew up in the house of a rabbi. I said, but the truth is my father's rabbinate was very different because he came to be a rabbi not long after the Holocaust had ended. And the priority was building the land of Israel, building Jewish schools, building the federation, building synagogues, and of course, building the land of Israel. And his focus was much more communal. We talked about that for a while, fine. So then for the next few weeks, I won't lie to you, I kept running by the newsstand to see if my Newsweek had come out. And finally, I go to the newsstand, I remember it was the one on Robertson and Pico. Some of you may remember that newsstand. And there it was. It said, talking to God. I grab it off the shelf and I open it up and there's a picture of me and underneath there are a couple paragraphs that begin as follows. I grew up in my father's house, but he never once mentioned God. Now, at the time, my father was still the rabbi of a large congregation in Philadelphia. <laughs> and I could just imagine what his congregants would say when they read that. And, and I knew which ones. Um, so, of course, I, I run to my office. And I call my father. And my father, who was a wonderful and warm and kind and forgiving. He said, look, don't worry about it. This is what happens, you know, because I thought he could, I knew my father wouldn't yell at me, but he might go for a sort of guilt light, you know, the way Jews do. It's like, it's okay, but you have to be very careful when you talk to the press. And I'm not hurt. I just hope people don't know it, you know, that kind of thing. But he didn't. He didn't. He just said, don't worry about it. It's really okay. <clears throat> then I called my mother. My mother, didn't say a word. Instead, I went through the whole thing. I said, this is what happened, this is what it said, da 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 And all she said was, uh-huh, <laughs> was it. About a week later, there's a letter for those of you who don't know, letters are things that people used to write <laughs> before there was email. There's a letter in my mailbox, and I see it's from my father, and my heart sinks. Because I thought, you know, he's, I'm sure he's not happy about this. I don't know what he's going to say, but it's, so I open it up, and it's just a, a piece of typing paper. It's not as stationary, and it reads, Dear David, God, 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 God. Love, Dad. P.S. This is just in case time calls you for an interview. <laughs> of course, the subject was real, which is that there is something about discussion of God that tends to make Jews uncomfortable. We talk about Israel, and we talk about anti-Semitism, and we talk about politics. But it is very rare that someone comes up to another person at a 
bar or bat mitzvah party and says, so what do you think about God anyway? But I'm going to talk to you about God. And the first thing that I want to say is that anyone who speaks about God has to begin by saying that they don't know what they're talking about. Because think of when you were two years old. Could you understand what an adult is? Of course not. And whatever God is, God is greater in proportion to us than we are to two-year-olds. So when someone says God wants this or says this or needs that, realize that we have such a small sliver of understanding next to whatever that is that we call God. That you have to speak about it by beginning with humility and not with hubris, by a confession that you don't really know and you can only share what your own impressions and thoughts are, but you don't teach it the way you teach mathematics. And I feel about God what Buber once said when he said, God cannot be expressed, only addressed. In other words, you can't really talk about what God is like, but you can talk to God. You can have an experience inside yourself. You can look up at a star-studded night and feel like, I don't know what the universe is, but somehow I can speak to it and it addresses me that there's something in me that connects to that which is infinitely greater than I am, that I don't want to live my entire life on the ground floor. I want to feel like I can be elevated and there is something to elevate me. When God comes to Israel at Sinai in the Torah, one Jewish theologian said something beautiful said the only word that comes directly from God is the first word of the Ten Commandments. It's written right up there, which is Anochi, I am. That's all you can really know. Everything after that is a midrash. Everything after that is our interpretation. What we really needed was the I am and, and another theologian goes farther, the first letter of Anochi is Aleph, which is silent. God comes to us sometimes in silence, but silence that is deep. And we have to rise to meet that moment and that occasion. I don't believe in a God who sits up there with a beard and looks down and says, okay, I'm going to cure this person and not that person, and I'm in favor of this team winning the championship and of that country winning the battle. We make God very small when we make God our concerns in the world. What does God want? God must want what I want. God must love what I love. God must hate what I hate. But remember how we started out by saying we have no idea. No idea. We can't possibly expand our minds enough to understand what God thinks or if God thinks the way we talk about thinking. What God feels or if God feels the way we think about thinking, about feeling, who could possibly know that? But we can do what our ancestors did and we can experience God and take from that experience the best of what is in us and feel like the tiny spark of God that is in us connected to that greater, unfathomable flame. And so we go out into the world with some sense of mission and of purpose and of goodness and of love. I really believe that that's what our ancestors experienced. And then, as people do when they have a great experience, what happens? All the words rush in because you have to talk about it. What's the first thing that happens when you have some phenomenal experiences? You say, oh my God, I have to call this person or tell that person. 
But then you realize that the words can't capture the experience. Our experience of God is purer than our discussion of God. And so there should be this secret chamber in the human heart where you feel it, and when someone says, do you believe in God, you are entirely entitled to say to them, that's a bad question. It's a bad question. It's not a question of, I thought about it and I believe. The question is, does the spark in you connect to something that is infinitely greater in this universe? Do you feel a mystery? Do you open your eyes sometimes in the morning and you say, Mode Ani, I am grateful because you feel the sense of gratitude for the wonder and awesomeness and remarkable variety and endless interest of the world in which we live, and you don't want to make your life so narrow as to make it about grievances or screens. You want something bigger. You want to experience all that is, and that's what it means when you say that you have a sense of God in your life, not that you sit there and you tote up the results and you say there are five arguments for and four arguments against, so I must believe. Remember that the Jewish people were the first ones that felt this in the world. While other people were worshiping mountains and worshiping winds and worshiping sun, Avraham comes along and says, there's something bigger, and, and it doesn't start off by believing. He starts off with a mission. Lech lecha me'artzacha, go forward. The first thing that Avraham does is he feels a compulsion to go. That life is a journey, that his spark is calling him. I hope that you understand that our idea of God is so much bigger than we usually say. And that you won't allow it to be narrowed to the size of partisanship or argument or politics or countries or anything other than the immensity that is greater than the universe. So that's why. That's why when we bless in the name of God, when we say, Yivarech Ka Hashem, what we're saying is together, all of us should live a life of blessing. We'll get it right, we'll get it wrong, but we know that there is a greater reality to which we can live in some fidelity, with some truth, with some hope. This is what the Jewish people brought into the world. This enormous idea, so big, that we still haven't begun to grasp it. This is what Anochi means. I am. And this is why, when God says, I am, as with Avraham, our answer is not, oh, I believe it, or prove it, but hineni, I'm here. Shabbat